Listener Production. Hey, Sasha Barbagat with you. Welcome to The Briefing. The way we consume media has changed so much over the last decade. The days of sitting around the telly watching your choice of four or five channels of free-to-air TV are long gone. We now hit up streaming services, digital TV, YouTube, not to mention our video consumption on platforms like TikTok, Facebook and Instagram. The problem is, when it comes to watching sport, the free-to-air channels are not allowed to show matches or events on their streaming channels. We should be just saying free sport is the right of every Australian and it should be every Australian should be able to access their television service how they want. The laws need to be updated to reflect that. In the second half of the briefing, we're taking a deep dive on a new campaign that's trying to keep sport free in Australia and what anti-siphoning laws have to do with it. Before that, though, Simon Beaton is here with me for the headlines. It is Monday, June 17. Hey, Sash. So Anthony Albanese will meet with China's Premier today for high-level talks, including on the fate of jailed Australian academic Yang Hung Jun. The Prime Minister is expected to use a major speech in front of Li Qiang to declare that while progress is being made in restoring diplomatic relations between Australia and China, he won't be silent when it comes to disputes. A large group of supporters of Premier Li gathered in Canberra to greet him as he arrived in the capital yesterday. So too did protesters. Yeah, advocates for pro-democracy writer Dr Yang, who has been jailed and given a suspended death sentence in China, are pressuring the PM to directly demand his release at this meeting today. Now, Albanese has signalled he will raise Dr Yang's case with Premier Li and he'll also question a series of tense encounters between the Australian Defence Force and China's Navy in both the South China Sea and the Yellow Sea. So, Simon, a big meeting today. Um, The other thing that happened over the weekend was Premier Lee's visit to Adelaide Zoo. Now, you might have heard the words panda diplomacy being thrown around. It certainly uh, got my attention. So Adelaide Zoo is home to the only two giant pandas in the Southern Hemisphere. Big draw card for Adelaide, right? However, uh, this pair... Wang Wang and Fu Ni have not bred. They've been there for about 15 years and they have never produced a cub. Mm. Uh, and so Premier Lee, while on his visit to Adelaide Zoo, actually promised to partake in a panda swap. So we're going to get two new pandas from China. Wang Wang and Fu Ni are going to be sent back. So while it seems like kind of a strange thing to trade animals It's actually seen as a gift and a sign of goodwill from China. Uh, And when making the commitment, uh, Premier Li said things were, quote, back on track between Australia and China. Even if they are not here today at the first summit, we have succeeded in bringing back to the world the idea that joint efforts can stop war and establish a just peace. That was Ukraine's President Vladimir Zelensky speaking at a two-day peace summit in Switzerland, which has wrapped up overnight. The event culminated in over 80 countries and international organisations signing in joint support of Ukraine's territorial integrity. Now, the document called for the withdrawal of Russian troops from Ukraine, the restoration of pre-war borders and the end of hostilities. Yeah, so a big show of support for Ukraine from predominantly Western and European countries. Uh, Several countries, including India, South Africa, Saudi Arabia, Thailand, Brazil, they were at the summit, but they did not sign the joint agreement. Unsurprisingly, these countries all have strong trading relationships with China. And There have been comments as well about how much could really change from the summit, given that neither Russia nor China were in attendance. Now, Russia was not invited. Um, China declined its invite. And on the topic of of whether this will achieve anything, as I said, it's a big show of support for Ukraine. and, And, you know, Volodymyr Zelensky was there with all the other world leaders talking about what he wants for the future of Ukraine. Uh, he said parties had agreed to work in special groups on what he called action plans for peace, which he said will open the way to a second peace summit. But the head of the European Commission said it is going to take time to achieve peace in Ukraine because this forum, it's not a negotiation for peace with Russia. Russia wasn't there. Russia wasn't invited. Mm. Uh, And also uh, the head of the European Commission made the point that Putin doesn't want to end the war. He wants capitulation. He wants Ukraine to cede territory, even territory that isn't occupied. So... 
We've seen this a lot over the last few months, you know, negotiations for peace in war-torn areas Mm. where all these people get together and they throw out all these big ideas. But at the end of the day, you need both sides who are warring to actually come together and have this conversation. And Russia wasn't there. Robert Irwin is threatening to sue One Nation over a cartoon the political party made depicting him and Bluey on an error-ridden trip through Queensland. In the clip published to Pauline Hanson's Please Explain YouTube channel, Irwin and the cartoon dog encounter potholes, a failing health system and dangerous use. Let's hear some of it. Oi, Bluey, your dog! Oh, no! It's them juvenile delinquents again! Oh, no! Bluey's being bashed! Well, lucky for us, we've got an awesome premiere here in the state of Queensland. (laughs) Oh, man, I can't believe this is the state of Queensland. Pretty comical. Yeah, in a letter from Irwin's lawyer, One Nation has been ordered to remove the video by 5pm today, saying it may mislead viewers into believing he has an affiliation with a political party. Uh, Hanson's chief of staff, James Ashby, has responded, telling the young celeb to, quote, lighten up. (laughs) Uh, The statement went on to say his dad always had a good sense of humour and most Queenslanders, most Aussies, always saw that larrikin side of Steve. Now, I've got to admit, I had a giggle when I watched it. It's pretty funny. Uh, Robert Irwin's claims for uh, defamation have been labelled pretty weak by a couple of expert defamation lawyers. Uh, It doesn't look like One Nation's going to remove the video, though. No, no, no. It sounds like they're standing pretty tall. Also, like Ashby, uh, the chief of staff, did say as well that uh, Robert was the hero of the piece. Mm. I don't know if I necessarily agree with that. He does kind of come across as a little bit uh, blundersome. Yeah. Um, So I understand why Robert wouldn't like it particularly, but he's definitely called a lot more attention to the video. Mm. Yeah, well, it had 100, when I checked this morning, it had 173,000 views, which isn't, like it's, you know, it's decent, but it's not that much. I think the other issue is that Bluey and Robert have been used for Queensland tourism campaigns in recent times. And so there's just, I can understand the fear that the ordinary punter might not go, oh, this is a send up. Um, However, uh, you know, most reasonable people probably would realise it's a joke. And it's been a big weekend of positive press for the British royals who have capped it off with social media posts to commemorate the UK's Father's Day. Kate, after making a what some might call triumphant return to public duties, has posted an image of William and his three kids with the caption, we love you, Papa. Sorry, I hate saying that word. We love you, Papa. (laughs) Uh, She took the picture. Internet sleuths are yet to pick it apart, Simon. Will's also posted his own snap of him and King Charles when he was a young kid, captioning it, Happy Father's Day, Pa. Do you prefer Pa to Papa? No, I don't know. I don't like either. The family was all smiles on the balcony at Buckingham Palace on Saturday to celebrate the monarch's birthday with the traditional Trooping the Colour. Yeah, that's the annual event that's used to mark the monarchs or the monarchy's official birthday. King Charles's birthday is actually November 14. Uh, he's a Scorpio. Just like me. Yeah, uh, yeah, So yeah. pop off King. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm a Cap. Capricorn, and we actually get along really well with Scorpios. All right, well. Um, But, yeah, we haven't seen Kate in public since Christmas, so this was a really big moment for her. All the commentary I saw online over the weekend was, you know, how how great it was to see her back, and she did. She looked really well. Uh, She's continuing to receive treatment. I believe that this was going to be kind of a a one-off. This is a big event for the monarchy. This is the annual event for them to all attend, aside from maybe the Christmas Day church service. So, um, The fact that she was there, I think, was really important. And King Charles as well, it's worth noting, is still getting cancer treatment as well. He returned to public duties in April. But, yeah, I think you could call it a big weekend of very positive press for the royal family. Simon, thank you so much for being here for the headlines. Next up, we are getting into our deep dive on why free sport is at risk in Australia. Most of us love our sport, and for generations we've watched the footy, the cricket, the tennis, the netball, the Olympics. Games that have helped define Australia as a nation on free-to-air television. But does anyone still watch free-to-air TV anymore? According to national polling, less than 30% of Australians exclusively watch TV through an antenna on their roof. Most of us now watch our favourite shows on streaming services. And that's a big problem for the free stations that have been giving us access to the biggest sporting events for free forever. You see, 
Anti-siphoning laws have historically prevented pay TV broadcasters from buying the rights to sport and other significant TV events before free-to-air TV has a chance to bid on them. But these laws don't extend to the digital space. So channels like 9, 10 and 7, which offer free streaming services in competition with massive overseas companies like Apple and Netflix, are warning they won't be able to show the massive sporting events Australians love for free in the future unless the laws are changed. So to make sense of all of this, I'm joined by Bridget Fair, CEO of Free TV. Bridget, thanks so much for joining us. Your organisation represents free-to-air broadcasters like 7, 9 and 10. You're launching a campaign today called Keep Sport Free. Why? What are the stakes here? Well, we know that about 9 in 10 Australians describe themselves as sports fans and most of those people like to watch sports for free on their television um, and they want to share that experience with their friends and family. So we want to make sure that that can continue to be the case. And what's threatening that? Explain the situation. So uh, a lot of people might not know we've got some laws in Australia that protect the availability of free sport on television. They're called the anti-siphoning laws. And what they do is they're designed to stop pay TV broadcasters from buying up the exclusive rights to sports before they can be bought by free-to-air broadcasters. And that has served us very well over the last 20 years or so and it means that most of the most popular sports that we all like to enjoy are available for free on our televisions. So what's at stake is that these laws are now a bit out of date because probably uh, most people are watching differently to the way they were. A lot of people don't have aerials on their homes anymore Uh, and the laws are a bit out of date in the sense that they don't take into account the fact that we are now watching TV over the internet and we're either using free streaming services like 7 Plus or 10 Play or 9 Now or uh, we might be doing other kinds of streaming like watching Netflix or Amazon. But what we don't want to do is be forced to pay to watch something that we're currently getting for free. Is this, on the other hand, a question of the free TV operators failing to meet consumers where they are. They've not kept up with the competition overseas. Uh, Look, I I don't think so. I think free-to-air broadcasters have invested a lot over the last 10 to 15 years in making sure that their services are available where people want to watch them. So we used to just be over the air using an aerial and every broadcaster now provides their services using a free streaming app. So if you want to watch on your phone or you want to watch on your tablet or your laptop, you can tune in to one of those free streaming apps and increasingly that's what people do. In fact, we know that seven out of 10 people now describe themselves as using those digital services to watch their television on a regular basis and probably only one in three say they only ever use the aerial delivered service. So broadcasters have spent a lot of time and energy trying to make sure that their services are available where people want to watch them. Why should sport be free? Sport is one of those things that actually brings our country together, I think. It's a bigger thing than whether you're just a football fan or you like to watch the golf or whatever it is. It's actually about the kind of community that we want to live in. I think we saw it really recently with the Matildas and uh, last year I think it was almost impossible if you got on a bus or a train or anything during that time that the Matildas World Cup campaign was on we were all part of it and it was something that you know went to work you talked to your friends about what was happening you were really on the edge of your seat in that penalty shootout it connects us now we're living in a, a world now where there's so many things that Uh, divide us much more. Things like social media where algorithms just deliver something different to you than it's going to deliver to me. So some of these things that create communities and connections are more important than ever before, I think. And so this research that's coming out today found 67% of Australians surveyed support anti-siphoning laws that would protect access to free sport and 69% support extending those laws to digital services. That's a pretty high level of support. But do you think that this number might change over time as 
particularly young people who um, lean towards streaming services become the dominant consumer market. Is free-to-air sport something that mainly attracts boomers? Oh, absolutely not. We see young people flock to watch those sports and, again, something like the Matildas or record high audiences last year for the NRL and AFL Grand Final. And what was interesting about those figures was the number of people watching using a streaming app and the number of young people in particular over-indexing in accessing their sport that way. So I think sport is something that still drives those emotions, whether you're a boomer or whether you're a Gen X or any of the other ones, any of the other letters. (laughs) Um, But we uh, have to make sure that it's available where people want to watch. That's what's critical and that's what that survey is showing. It's saying, yes, we think those laws that protect free sport are really important and Yes, we think those laws should be updated because we're not all just sitting here with an aerial on our homes on the roof and plugging our 50s style TV sets into them. We want to be able to watch it on the go. We want to be able to watch it wherever we are. We want to watch it in our bedrooms and young people particularly are driving that change. What are you hearing from the politicians about this? Um, What's the government been saying? Well, Inexplicably, the government has introduced laws into the parliament that say that they're updating the anti-siphoning rules, so protecting free sport. But the laws they've introduced only ensure that uh, sports will be available if you watch your television over the aerial, uh, which we know is a dwindling number of people and particularly young people, almost none. They're all watching using their free streaming apps. So these laws really need to be fixed because what will happen is that for a broadcaster, say half my audience is watching over the aerial delivered service and half is watching through my free streaming app. If I can only buy the rights to show to half of my audience, then firstly, half of them are missing out. And secondly, as a broadcaster, I have to be able to pay for those rights by generating advertising revenue. And to do that, I need to be able to reach the widest number of people. So ultimately, what these laws will do is that we'll see sports start to disappear off our TV screens in the longer term. And that would be an absolute tragedy. Would there be also flawed effects if elite sport is not available free to air? Do you think that that would, I suppose, trickle down all the way down to local sports clubs? Yeah, look, I do. And there's a test case that we um, we can show what happens when sport goes off free-to-air television. So they have some similar laws in the UK. And uh, what happened quite a few years ago was that the cricket rights um, came off the list that required it to be put onto free-to-air television. And so the only way you could watch the Ashes is uh, by subscribing to Sky. So when that happened, what we saw was that the participation rates in cricket in the UK plummeted over the next decade. Uh, And in fact, you know, maybe some of the poor performances of the English cricket team can be attributed to some of that. Um, I think it's uh, absolutely essential for participation that people can see their heroes on screen, they can share in those moments, and that's what makes you want to be those things. Could you tell me about the kind of level of competition that free-to-air channels are facing from the likes of Apple, Amazon, Disney, Netflix? What, What does that look like? Look, it's never been more competitive than it is right now. Um, People have got more choice in things to watch than they've ever had before. What that means for broadcasters is that obviously we have a bigger issue in terms of hanging on to our audiences and also to hang on to our revenue because a lot of those platforms are also moving into advertising. So there's going to be ad tiers on Amazon and Netflix and Apple, for example. So that's important for us to make sure that we have a sustainable model into the future, which is another reason that the sports rights are really important because one of the things that free-to-air broadcasters do that those streaming platforms don't do is that we invest in loads of Australian content. Mm. We make heaps and heaps of news. 
We are obviously delivering a lot of live and free sport. We invest in entertainment programming and drama. We spend about $1.6 billion a year on Australian content, which is more than anyone else. If we want to protect those things for the future, we have to have a sustainable free-to-air broadcast sector. Um, So we've got to have laws because we're very regulated. All the laws that affect us have to be set up for the future. They do want choice. They do want to watch streaming. They do want to watch Netflix and Amazon, that's for sure. But they also want to know that those things, local news, live and free sport, Australian content and entertainment are still there when they want them. Finally, what do you need from the government to uh, fix this into the future and what do you feel will be the consequences if this campaign fails? So what do we need? We need the government to listen and fix these laws and make sure they're ready for the future so that um, people can watch free sport no matter how they access their television service. We shouldn't be distinguishing between people based on whether you've got a stick on your house or whether you don't. We should be just saying free sport is the right of every Australian and it should be every Australian should be able to access their television service how they want. The laws need to be updated to reflect that. What's going to happen if that doesn't happen? Uh, We're just going to keep going. This is so important. It's important for our industry. It's also important for Australians. I mean, these laws are really about a public interest. They're much more than the commercial interest of any one person. They're about the kind of country we want to live in. And we want to live in a country where when the Olympics rolls around or when the Matildas are on a roll or whatever it is that we're following, that we can all share in those experiences, not just the people that can afford to subscribe to streaming services. Well, we'll be watching with interest. Bridget, thanks so much for joining us on The Briefing. Thanks for having me. That was Free TV CEO Bridget Fair. And thanks for listening to this morning's episode of The Briefing. We'll be back again with another deep dive from Three. Before you go, though, we'd love it if you could share this app with someone you think might enjoy it. And did you know you can watch a lot of the interviews we do here on The Briefing and The Weekend Briefing on YouTube? Just search Listener Newsroom, that's L-I-S-T-N-R Newsroom, and hit subscribe. And if you want to keep up with our other content, search The Briefing Podcast on TikTok and Instagram. I'm Ben Sion Siebert. Catch you next time. Listener.